hope the first session was definitely informative. Moving forward, the session two's topic will be facilitating inclusive and sustainable growth. Or C. P. Morgan. I request the following speakers for session two, please, to join us on the dais. I request Mr. Vivekanand Salimat, Chairman, IDF Financial Services Private Limited, to please join us on the stage. I request Dr. L. H. Manjunath, E. D. S. K. D. R. D. P. to please join us on the stage. I now request Mr. A. Ramesh Kumar, Chairman and MD, La Raksha, Impact Finance Enterprise Private Limited, to please join us on the stage. I now request Mr. Anburat C, DGM, Sid B, to please join us on the stage. I now request. Mr. Chelladurai A, National Head, Mic Microfinance, Equitas Small Finance Bank, to kindly join us on the stage. I now request our speaker, Mr. N. Ganesh, Senior Vice President, Samunati, to please join us on the stage. And to begin the session two, and now uh, over to Mr. C. P. Mohan. Gigi, my good friend, for this opportunity to be here moderating uh, a very interesting session on inclusion and sustainability. I just make an opening remark, and then uh, probably we'll pass the baton to each, uh, you know, on a set of rules. Um, first of all, compliments to Sadhan for looking beyond business. And, uh, you know, it's a very significant message from Sadhan that collaboration is very important and regional collaborations are all as, as important as at, is at, the, at the national level. Yeah, it's very important for stakeholders to come together uh, because the world is all about segmentation. Uh, uh, excellent, excellent message that you recognize this and implement it at, uh, at great, with, with great effort. Thank you so much for that. And uh, the heartiest congratulations, uh, Gigi, on your, on your, your role as CMDC. You, I'm sure you bring in new effort, new vigor. Um, so uh, first of all, you know, just to, to, to pitch uh, what we are talking about, financial inclusion, uh, sustainable development, I'll, my opening statement is like this, that uh, uh, credit is arguably uh, the, a fundamental prerequisite for development. Uh, development, when you say development of participative, inclusive type, it's very important that we have, uh, we have credit backing it. And I think uh, at both the practice and the policy level, uh, Professor Yunus Clarion called that uh, credit has to be a fundamental right at the global agenda is very important. Uh, I think uh, because we, uh, we'll come to a little bit of that when we speak when we hear from the speakers. Uh, so both that uh, you know both that policy and practice is something which need to be recognized uh, very very clearly. I would also like to state, and I would like validations from panels here, that the microfinance acts as a barometer, the barometer of socioeconomic performance. You have seen that the moment there were stresses in the socioeconomic melee, microfinance got affected. And this is because this is a barometer of widespread distress in society. And I think this has to be seen beyond a financial metric and recognized as a social metric of what's happening to millions of our countrymen and women. So uh, there is a saying, I'm, I know, 
that uh, the growth of gold loan is indicative of stress among people. And uh, this is an old man saying, so you could ignore it. But I can say that in modern days, with microfinance taking center stage in terms of extremely distributive credit growth, I think it's important that we understand that it acts as a barometer of stress. And therefore, the whole approach to the sector has to be in recognition of that. I'll just stop by talking about one aspect which another panel would be taking up. Uh, you know, the, given the criticality of microfinance in the role of microcredit, providing microcredit, in the everyday life of the many people, I'm borrowing a phrase from IKEA, you know, it impacts the everyday life of many people. It's very important that we also talk about institutional sustainability much as we would talk about the, the you know, online sustainability of what happens with credit, which is also very important. Therefore, my point is this, that I would like another panel to take it up, that just as we talk about capitalization of banks, because there is an ownership-driven recapitalization exercise, which annually go on, I think there is a great merit for two things to happen. One is uh, the, 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 the need for a nap national capitalization fund for microfinance. Uh, this is because if you accept the stress of microfinance as an indicative stress of socioeconomic strata, then it makes sense. And the other is a consortium of funders who would, because yet the last panel also talked about uh, the kind of you know need for funding at the equity level, at the regulatory capital level, uh, particularly given that there are heavy, heavy uh, you know uh, provisioning norms. They have high. Car norms and so on and so forth. So I will leave this opening statement here, and uh, I have my good friend uh, Shalimar. He, you know, my first loan uh, in Appins as as one of the initial MDs who put it up. Uh, my first loan, how we got it rolling, was a crore of loan to Shalimar. Thank you for paying it back. I would have lost my job. Uh, we have Mr. Manjunath. Salvot, uh, you know, into sustainable livelihood-based financing. Ganesh is here from Samunadi. Uh, farmers look up to you. And uh, we have others, uh, I think, from Sidby here. And uh, yeah, I have a couple of people I do not know. Um, was Ramesh Kumar, I met him when he was CGM SBI. And I used to second at RBI's CAB Pune uh, long ago. And I think, yeah, so we had, uh, it was, yeah, that was a time when I was part of his team, which came up with the business correspondent model. Yeah, yeah. So, and Sidby, as usual, uh, the foundation did a wonderful job setting up the sector. So, my question, we, what we will do is we will divide this into financial inclusion and uh, sustainability as a separate content. Uh, because as a praxis guy, I think the devil, not even the devil, even the, e e even, even the heaven lies in the detail. So, uh, so, so, so to start with uh, Shalimar, you know, the, you know, the friendship bias. Uh, uh, you know, when you talk about financial inclusion, you know, you know, what is your, your outlook on financial inclusion? And I will ask this question to each of you. You know, you know there are perspectives like financial transactional inclusion. There are also need-based inclusion, but somebody need to be in the system and therefore get included. And there are actually supply-driven inclusion requirements like DBTs and so on and so forth. So my request is that each of you could take up uh, your, your, your understanding of the dimensions of inclusion that you want and how uh, that could be kind of facilitated, accelerated. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, panel head Sri Mohanji. 
I also congratulate him for uh, raising an important point, though uh, I'm little out of the question, that uh, National Capitalization Fund. Uh, I cannot resist uh, uh, not commenting on that. Uh, if you look at about uh, 38,000 uh, crores of uh, I mean finance, which the uh, NBFC sector is giving, let's say 15% of that is a capital. And all of it, this capital, majority of it has come from foreign countries. So, uh, one of the sustainability Atma Nirbhar is also that we rely on ourselves. So, in that context, I endorse his view that uh, National Capitalization Fund should be there. So, that it is one of the long-term strategy for uh, uh, sustainability as well as uh, Atma Nirbharata. So, then uh, next to the question. Uh, if you look at the definition of uh, financial inclusion, why the term financial inclusion came? In fact, this came from uh, UK. Then Rangarajanji gave a definition of financial inclusion. In that, what they say is affordable. He uses the word affordable. Affordable savings, credit, then uh, insurance as well as pension. So he says everybody should have access so that they not only carry out their livelihoods, but also mitigate risks and uh, continue to grow and contribute to the uh, their own growth as well as the national growth. So therefore, uh, if, uh, if you look at the analysis of the economies of the world, India is the only country which relied on savings or internal capital mobilization. Rest of the countries always depend on credit. They borrow their future earnings and then spend. Whereas our people have continued to save. That is what uh, SAG movement said as thrift. It was, it was not that surplus. It is something which out of their own consumption saved and then it created a thrift. So therefore, uh, people should have access and the ability to create the thrift gave them ability to borrow also. That is the basic concept of self-help group. So therefore, Unfortunately, because of the JLG model, which we borrowed from Bangladesh, that saving concept is not there in the JLG model. It's only in the SSG model. That, that also slowly, slowly is uh, uh, sidelined as we speak of growth. So therefore, we should again refocus using all the digital technology that saving should also be part of their psychology because only if I save, I can come out of various kinds of risk. And then, uh, when we look at the credit, credit uh, uh, is reaching, but is it affordable? There is no choice because they have to borrow. Even today, access is more important than the cost. Because the formal financial system, though it can deliver low cost products, but it hardly delivers. So therefore, they have no choice but to borrow at a higher cost because they are aspirational and they want to grow. Even in urban areas I have seen, People borrow at 50% per annum, still repay properly. So that only goes to show that excess is still important. And insurance, uh, it is there only if it is loan linked. But uh, education regarding uh, the insurance products, affordability, if it is not linked to borrowing, is not there. So therefore, insurance is another area where a lot of work needs to be done. Then regarding uh, pension, uh, remittance, so these are the areas if uh, uh, affordability and other factors are there so that they can easily do. So this Jandan has really done a great way. Uh, that becomes a starting uh, platform on which we need to build and see that comprehensive financial services at affordable costs are available to all citizens of the country. Thank you. Let me take this to Ramesh. You know, you've been uh, here as well as there. <laughs> so. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so what's your perspective on financial inclusion? We'll come to sustainability later. I think the basic of financial inclusion is identification of a need. I think if we are not able to focus on a need, I think the delivery is not very effective and it really uh, does not give the kind of value add which happens when an identified need is met through a specially devised or an appropriate tool or methodology so that there is actually fulfilling of the need and hence satisfaction and in terms of growth. Growth with sustainability and inclusion is really what is needed. Growth is needed for every economy, for every institution. But does it 
always come with sustainability and inclusion no but it is challenging but not impossible it is very much possible and even microfinance industry has proved it to some extent that this can be done with innovation with technology and with collaboration if these three fundamental elements can be put into the model growth with sustainability and inclusion is possible and when we look at sustainability what are the real elements maybe you can look at economic sustainability environmental sustainability if you look at economic sustainability most of what microfinance has addressed so far is really inclusion in terms of meeting some identified needs and gaps between incomes and expenditure but it has not met the important it has met the urgent but not the important i think now is a stage when microfinance needs to progress to that level of sustainability where the important can be covered the important is education healthcare shelter water quality i think microfinance loans need to address targeted specific end use specific uh, loans in these segments then i think the sustainability would be more permanent and would really make a big difference to the quality of life on the environmental side green products of course even in the earlier session it, uh, and in the opening session it was talked about i think this is a time when green products energy saving products uh, substitutes are becoming a little more attractive because they are becoming a little more viable financially compared to existing uh, highly uh, planet destructive products so that is an area where both individuals and institutions have to concentrate as mfis or lending institutions do we know our carbon footprint none of us know it how do we do it it's a very complex process can we develop a tool a relatively simpler and easy adaptable tool where each of us as a lending institution can measure our carbon footprint and say going forward every year uh, there would be a target for reduction of my carbon footprint i think that focus is what is now needed and that focus will then get carried on to transfer to our microfinance clients for pushing them towards more of planet friendly carbon neutral or carbon redu reducing practices we uh, recently launched a roofing loan initiative where it was not just a loan it was a combination of roofing loan plus knowledge inputs what is what are disaster resilient practices of roof building how what should be the distance between two purlins what should be the distance between two rafters what should be the overhang angle and uh, length so that the roof doesn't lift off like an aeroplane so lot of these inputs need to make the loan sustainable and the initiative itself sustainable i think these are the kind of you know opening out of the loan um, uh, you know um, uh, blinkers to other areas is required we are now looking to launch a water atm loan it is not just for providing purification of water at the village level at a, in a decentralized manner but also creating micro entrepreneurs so it is very important to go from in a small uh, consumption oriented lending to micro entrepreneurship can we find new ways of doing a sustainable progress with creating entrepreneurship we thought that this would be one important area where we should focus upon in the future i think these are the kind of things that we have to do then one point on that uh, fund that you were talking about i think it's very critical and uh, it's uh, very happy that in a large forum like this you have raised it we need a fund not just for providing equity for microfinance institutions but even for debt funds a dedicated microfinance oriented special purpose vehicle which can raise its own funds for through bonds with a full or partial sovereign guarantee so it will be very easy for them to raise funds with a sovereign guarantee at much lower uh, cost uh, costs and then they would be able to uh, you know lend uh, or even uh, uh, invest in equity at affordable rates and that would really trickle down the cost for the end borrowers also 
Thank you. So that's an important thing that you know you you speak of sustainability and then uh, there are you know once the idea of sustainability and to the the width and breadth of sustainability actually also pinches impinches on on financial inclusion from a need perspective. So that's very good. Uh, coming to Mr. Hegde, he, you know, Hegde's organization is something which has been steeped in community. Um, I'm sure he has a lot of stories to speak about uh, in terms of how finance has helped in, in economic inclusion, you know, being part of the overall growth story of a country. So over to you. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mohanan. I am not Hegade. Hegade is my mentor, oh. and his name is uh, Virendra Hegade. I don't go by the name Hegade. I am uh, Manjunath here. I am the executive director of uh, uh, SKDRDP, Shri Kshetra Dharmasthala. Uh, no, 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 no problem. I just want to inform everybody that I am not the Hegade. <laughs> so that's it. <clears throat> yeah, thank you very much. Actually, um, when we talk of financial inclusion uh, in the MFI sphere, we, uh, ne we normally equate that mostly with uh, livelihoods and micro-enterprises. <clears throat> so financial inclusion per se, livelihoods and micro-enterprises are not the only things that are required by the people. In fact, uh, you have a great majority of unorganized labor lying out in the peri-urban and in the rural areas whose requirement is not enterprise or livelihood because they are already working somewhere as unorganized labor. And their requirement is uh, beyond uh, livelihood. Their requirement is infrastructure like housing, sanitation, water, uh, school, better schools, better health, and those kind of things. So I think even today, most of the monies in the microfinance sector are going towards those things, although we say they are going for livelihoods and microenterprises. Now, the cost of this fund, which is going to this infrastructure, needs to be... Uh, uh, actually uh, looked into and at 26%, 30%, I don't think this will be sustainable. So financial inclusion, somewhere the MFIs need to partner with mainstream banks. Mainstream banks have uh, funds available with them and because the, uh, the regulators are not allowing the MFIs to collect deposits, the low cost funds are lying with the uh, mainstream banks and, uh, and the MFIs are not having access to that. So there needs to be better partnership between the MFIs and the banks to really have a meaningful credit financial inclusion. Also, it will help uh, the MFIs and the customers uh, to have other kinds of financial inclusion as in having a savings account, as in having transfer facilities with when you partner with mainstream institutions. I think we need to, uh, as a lobby, as an institution, we need to look into how do we better partner with mainstream institutions because that is where I come from. I, I am a partner to the mainstream institution and I have done very well over the last 20 years. My portfolios have gone up to almost 20,000 crore now and I am generating surpluses enough and more when, even when compared to the microfinance institution. So there is a lot of opportunity lying there. So if you are really talking about financial inclusion, I consider financial inclusion as a mainstream financial inclusion. Pro Professor Malcolm Harper in his book has very clearly wrote, written uh, that um, the, the Microfinance institutions are actually applying uh, a sticker to the wound of a person and the moment the wound is healed, the sticker is taken away and the, your responsibility will be over when the wound is healed. Now I think uh, the sustainability of the financial MFIs also depend in, a, in the long run in their partnership with the mainstream institutions. So I think um, for doing this, the biggest problem uh, with the microfinance institution is that their capital adequacy. No, the banks don't look at the uh, MFIs uh, w without a particular capital adequacy. I, I was told by one of my friends, the banks only look at institutions which are having a 100 crore capital and nothing less than that. So I think, uh, um, of course, um, we have been discussing about availability of capital, capital within India, but I consider capital adequacy should not be a norm for helping the MFIs with mainstream credit. Why should we be... A, sticking on a 15% capital adequacy. We are only creating opportunities for the MFI investors to make money out of poor people. So I consider, I strongly suggest to the regulators to bring down the capital adequacy for the smaller MFIs to maybe 5, I mean FLDG, 5% should be enough. So 
you bring down the capital adequacy to 5% to make them eligible to get uh, assistance from the mainstream bank so that the mainstream money is going into the sector. Uh, of course, the second part is the insurance. Now, there's a great need and opportunity for financially inclusive in terms of the health and life insurance. Again, there are mainstream players here and then a lot of private players. Um, so, we need to have a negotiating table. I think MFI is coming together, bringing the volumes, and then, then really they can negotiate with the insurance companies, which is what SKDRP has done. With a 5 million client base, we are able to get the best rates from the, uh, the big, bigger uh, insurance companies. So, I think financial inclusion, not in just in terms of credit, but also in terms of savings as well as um, the insurance are the things of the matter and look beyond livelihood and micro enterprise, look towards financial uh, infrastructure. This is my uh, suggestion. Thank you so much. Yeah, so that's very important and uh, uh, it's very, very interesting that I've been part of that business correspondent committee uh, supporting HR Khan when it was, you know, in the initial days, the first circular on the 25th of January 2005. We, got, we drafted that circular outside of the uh, RBA corporate office in CAB. Um, so thank you for that validation and uh, uh, the, the pitch is that mainstream financial uh, sector is very important uh, and partnerships are possible. So that's one way. Uh, so before I come to the bank and to the bankers, uh, I would like Ganesh. Uh, Ganesh works in the space, uh, you know, NBFC, but there's a lot of lot of involvement with farmers. Uh, Samanyati is, you know, the go-to place uh, as far as FPOs are concerned in the country. So my my request is, you know, could you could you tell us a little bit experientially? Uh, you know, there's a lot of credit floating around apparently. Uh, in the, in in form of uh, crop loans and uh, Kisan credit cards and so on and so forth. But yet, how do you find that it is very important for you to come in and actually enable the inclusion process through your uh, kind of an organization? Thank you. Thank you, Mohan sir, and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Sadhan, for inviting Samunati. Uh, as Mohan sir said, uh, an honest confession, we are neither an MFI uh, nor an SFP, so uh, the kind of work that we do is uh, value chain uh, we are a value chain enabling organization. The topic for today's discussion, I'll digress a little and then come back to Monsa's question on sustainable and inclusive growth. For Samunati, growth means growth for the community and we are looking at growth uh, in their assets, uh, enhancing uh, and strengthening the activities that they do, enhancing the capabilities that the underlying members have. Uh, the assets, activities and capabilities jointly is what we call as strengthening uh, livelihoods. So Samunati is committed to look at moving, uh, graduating from finance as being uh, just the finance, uh, finance as a tool to an end, which is income enhancement for uh, the producers. So uh, when we looked at uh, uh, livelihood, focus on livelihoods, and we said uh, uh, two thirds of India is in rural and 70% of uh, rural is dependent on agriculture and allied activities. So it's imperative that we look at agriculture livelihoods as an important aspect of our focus and uh, that's what we uh, essentially do. Even within li uh, agriculture uh, livelihoods, we uh, look at, uh, uh, so uh, earlier realization as part of our, uh, for, uh, when, when Samunati was founded, uh, based on uh, the experiences that the community or the members of the community do not operate in isolation. They don't operate in a vacuum. They are, they are part of an ecosystem where there are buyers, sellers, service providers, and therefore they operate in a kind of a chain, right? And, and that's what we call value chain. So Samunati's approach, has been uh, to work on agriculture value chains uh, and the value chain has two elements to it the supply end and the demand end uh, the demand end comprises of enterprises where uh, uh, which is buying and the sell buyers and the sellers of uh, agri produce uh, what we have realized uh, to through our experience is that they operate at low equilibrium uh, essentially because of lack of capital and uh, so samunati tries and address this uh, working capital with agri enterprises to enable them to buy more and sell more, uh, and and it's a very uh, you know uh, in a in a in a manner which uh, builds on the strengths of the buyer and seller rather than collateral. What I'm going to dwell a little deep uh, is on the supply end of the value chain, which comprises of farmer and farmer collectives. And some of these core is to uh, core uh, is farmer collectives, uh, 
uh, we believe that uh, uh, making markets work for smallholder farmers is is an important uh, is a mission that we have uh, taken. In farmer collectives, we offer uh, uh, both non-financial services and financial services. Why non-financial services? Because the the farmer collectives, it could be farmer producer companies or like what Chairman Nabart said, could be cooperatives. Uh, in the new generation cooperatives, they are very nascent entities, and therefore, uh, 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 building them and enabling them and building their capacities is very very important for uh, for Samanati because you know that's the journey that we are going to go along with them. So we provide access to inputs, capacity building, uh, you know, technology transfer or enabling value chains, value addition processes, uh, and market linkages. And you know, market linkages. Uh, uh, last uh, last season, we've done uh, more than 32,000 tons of commodity purchase, uh, valued over 150 crores, kind of a thing. That's just a pilot. So that's a kind of enablement that we are trying to do on the non-financial front. On the financial access to the farmer producer organization, we uh, provide them access to. See, the well, FPOs have very low uh, share capital. Uh, more than three fourths of the FPOs have less than five lakhs of share capital, and therefore the ability to uh, reach markets to either buy inputs. They have to service. Essentially, farmer producer companies are institutions of the farmers, which need to service uh, the, them, which is to do with inputs uh, supplied to them on credit, output purchase on cash, and therefore there is a gap in the working capital. Samanati tries and addresses that, and that I believe is uh, you know making. And our, our impact uh, in doing access to finance has been uh, really strong, and we've reached over over four and a half thousand FPOs uh, connected to us directly, lending over 1,600 FPOs. The impact that we hear from the ground is substantial increase in the member base, increase in at least doubling the turnover. I think that's the strong base that uh, is is leading to to sustainability. I think, sir, that. Uh, as uh, access to finance and non-financial go hand in hand to ensure that there is a uh, larger, uh, uh, you know, membership, member engagement, member stake increases, and then the institution becomes stronger. And then when that happens, the uh, the produce can then link to the markets, and that's where the uh, growth and inclusion and sustainability can uh, come in. Sir. Thank you. That's a good pointers. You know, like uh, uh, you know. Work on the, you know, there is a value chain ecosystem available. You plug into that, add value within that value system, and enable processes. You know, the credit plus aspect of it, and then uh, all of it actually also, in from his perspective, results in uh, you know, enhancement or improvement in incomes uh, for the farmers. So that's kind of a virtuous cycle we see. Um, I'll now turn to uh, Chelladurai from Equitas, and I was, you know, I understand that there's a lot of, a uh, lot of your, uh, you you have a lot of attention, pay a lot of attention to small enterprises, working capital financing, and so on and so forth, uh, which is very important. And uh, what are your learnings in financial inclusion from people who need it to make to also go on to make people need it? Uh, more and more on enterprise financing, working capital, and so on and so forth. And uh, being from a small finance bank, uh, you are better pitched as of now. So good afternoon, anyone, everyone. So I'm Chaladurai. So I represent Equitas Small Finance Bank. So Equitas, um, I think most of the most of you would be aware aware that you know Equitas was a, started as a microfinance company, then got converted into a small finance bank. Uh, but our base. Uh, Earlier, you know, also when, my, when we were a microfinance company, at the time also we were serving the informal segment. And after becoming a bank, also our majority of the portfolio uh, is from uh, informal segment. Um, uh, so actually, uh, the inclusiveness and sustainability to, to take care of it. Actually, microfinance means uh, inclusiveness and sustainability. These two are the major. That is the gist of microfinance, which differentiates microfinance from other lending activity. So if this is not there, there is no microfinance. So at Equitas, you know, we have we have made very co conscious efforts to ensure that these two are not lost. Uh, so we handle the one is you know the bank, which is a the, where the commercial activities are uh, handled through the bank, and we have a Equitas Development Initiative Trust through which uh, the many activities focusing on sustainability are being uh, you know handled through the uh, trust. Uh, when it uh, when it comes to uh, the inclusiveness, actually 
when when we talk about financial inclusion majorly it is a credit that is what you know that comes into our mind because that is easy uh, to take it to the customer because customer wants it they need they they are in need of credit so you know it is it will be very easy to convince and uh, you know give the credit to the customer but that is an entry point once a customer enters through a credit relationship then you know we should focus on uh the entire gamut of financial services even uh, the credit is also you know the microfinance is just a, a starting point because the value of credit is also small but we do not know what is the quantum required by the customer so our next step is you know to understand what is the exact requirement of the credit and and also the purpose you know uh, the other panelist was also saying you know it should be a need based you know what are all the needs so uh, if you look at our journey actually the microfinance a customer enters through microfinance and then you know we get into a small business loan depending on the uh, you know the activity they undertake you know they move into uh, small business loans or a commercial vehicle commercial vehicle you know they uh, they uh, they might be interested to buy a small tata is or something like that so that you know they do some transportation related activities uh, then comes to our uh, the uh, liable affordable housing then uh, our liability relationships so that is how uh, you know our graduation process happens at equitas um uh, Uh, and uh, when we talk about inclusiveness uh, even uh, earlier in the previous panel they talked about different categories of customers like ultra poor and all we are also consciously uh, include uh, people who are differently abled transgenders so that you know they are not excluded and they also uh, you know uh, form uh, very much part of the ecosystem so those are all our efforts thank you yeah thank you so you also have uh, trust looking at some of the non credit requirements and kind of they pull it into each other you know kind of support each other and uh, it's important that uh, you're looking at a very very you know needy sector and uh, looking forward to more of it so coming to sidbi um you have been looking at this sector from a wider perspective so how do you see the sector aiding financial inclusion and uh, we will you know after that we will have very little time but uh, we will have a regulated approach to the next question which i'll have here so thank you uh, first of all good afternoon to all of you present here and i thank sadhan for giving sidbi this opportunity uh, yes as a banker uh, we if you see sir we always uh, think uh, any promoter he has to graduate to next level Uh, so uh, so microfinance uh, if anybody is uh, taking microfinance definitely uh, he should turn out to in, turn into a micro enterprise so that should be the objective or motive of any microfinance institutions and we also support that and uh, at sitbi i will just touch upon sitbi uh, overview about sitbi what it does and uh, uh, how we support a microfinance or micro uh, microfinance entrepreneurs so here is it be if you see sir we have a two major stream our mandate is to uh, promotion our mandate is promotion development and financing so in that pnd pnd may we do lot of activity for microfinance uh, maybe micro, it may be for microfinance entrepreneur entrepreneurs uh, and the financing part we have a two type of uh, two stream of financing one is the refinance and the other one is the direct finance under the refinance window if you see we fund to banks nbfcs and mfis so i will touch upon nmfis in a later part and the other side will be the direct finance direct finance is nothing but we give directly to the msme borrowers directly in our books we fund uh, so uh, here if you see uh, initially when sitbi was formed in 1990 so we started with the objective of promotion development financing subsequently we had uh, not we were not concentrating on credit approach but also on credit plus approaches so going forward if you see uh, in the entire msme ecosystem sitbi's presence is there so starting from a startup so if you have a startup if you have an innovative idea you wanted to do a startup so definitely we have a venture capital uh, limited sitbi venture capital limited is there okay next you have started a, you are starting a starting a business like a greenfield project so definitely sitbi's direct funding is there and we have floated cgt msc which is a very very uh, impactful uh, uh, trust basically Uh, for giving uh, collateral free or third party guarantee free loans so if you see up to 2 crore we are getting the loan under that scheme and uh, and the major changes are recently lot of changes have been made under cgtms earlier parentity it was only one once you can avail the loan now it has been made as a limit so n number of time you can take maximum limit uh, outstanding cannot go beyond 2 crore and we have a rxil which we have floated for to take care of the receivables exchange 
and we have an ISTSL for technology company which gives lot of technology for the entrepreneurs or the budding entrepreneurs. Uh, and PSB on loan, it's a marketplace kind of thing. So similar way, SIDBI is uh, contributing lot of uh, uh, various activities and the digital activities for support of MSMEs. In respect of financial inclusion, sir, if you see, uh, SIDBI is giving lot of uh, uh, weightage for uh, uh, promoting uh, this micro enterprises, micro enterprises, micro finance basically. So for example, I will say some two or three examples. Like we adopt certain villages and we go there and we we give a grant and to support the uh, women, basically women. Because if you see, they always shy away from getting loan or uh, talking to a banker or going to a banker and they always depend on the money lenders, basically. Because they always feel like getting a loan from a banker or microfinance institution is very difficult. Until and unless we approach them, they will not come forward for taking a loan. So here, uh, for a, just for giving an example, we uh, went to a ne nearby one village called uh, near Villupram on village, there we have promoted this terracotta cluster. There we, what we have done, we have done uh, to, uh, similar trainings for almost 50, 50 women, basically majorly women, in fact male members were also there and those members we have uh, advised them to uh, how to borrow from microfinance institutions and start up their own product. So similar way at Tutu Green we have done for fisheries. Uh, that way we are doing lot of activities and one more the main thing of my uh, what you call upgrading from uh, micro finance to micro enterprise so now government is also giving lot of push so the first push is that udyam assist platform which msm ministry of msme had uh, floated and sidbi is implementing that project so under which what we are doing all micro and finance borrowers they have to uh, come to that, that platform to register that and get the udyam registration that is the first thing so once you are coming to the platform, definitely some data will be there, then, that, then subsequently you will be getting very, very, uh, what do you call, you will be a, able to get a formal loan kind of thing. And one more thing, like SIDBI always uh, gives more trust on the skill, uh, three main thing, that is the skilling, next one will be the credit connect and will the market connect. So market connect also, now lot of online platforms are there. Uh, now the recent one, uh, which is that ONDC. So ONDC platform, we should look. In fact, uh, last month we have onboarded almost 50 to 100 weavers or the Terracotta cluster people. So these are the things we should uh, empower them to go to the next level. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so you have, uh, you spoke about a guarantee fund which is another enable, another financial product which is very required. As also, you have special approaches to women and clusters and, you know, focused approach to this. Very good. I hope. Uh, many of the partners uh, and the stakeholders would take up uh, this. I just have to say one thing about SIDBI, which I did not say, which is about Prayas. Prayas is a micro-enterprise loan, which the SIDBI is passing through uh, MFIs and uh, NGOs like us. And in, in Karnataka, we have a portfolio of about 600 crore in partnership with SIDBI as a Prayas loan. Prayas is a micro-enterprise loan for uh, ranging from 50,000 rupees to 5 lakh rupees. Of course, they have an FLDJ requirement for that. But, and it's priced very low. In fact, uh, for us, it's now priced at 11% yeah. to the customer. So including my commission, it goes at 11% to the customer. I, I think it's a very good product for the MFIs. I think the MFIs have a great chance to talk to SIDB um, for a price loan. Yeah. So that is a that's yeah, missing great. middle segment we cover under that. Yeah, so great. So, so we have products floating, but yeah, probably you need more people to take it and more funds into that. So we, we quickly turn, you know, and I will uh, uh, I, I will borrow five minutes of your lunch time uh, and I will be deficit by 15 minutes even then. Uh, so I hope you will agree. So there's a quick point, you know, this quick point and one minute to each of the panelists. Um, you see, when we talk about sustainability, uh, in terms of everything, including nation building, livelihood sustainability becomes very important and therefore l financing some way or the other, uh, the financing getting into livelihood enhancement becomes almost a national imperative. Uh, so given that, uh, one thing which, uh, you know, I have uh, had 40 years of, you know, 42 years of uh, experience in this rural sector, um, you know, one thing which probably has not been cracked is understanding cash flows. Um, and I think uh, that's very important that we 
get dynamic information. Uh, Mr. Chaji, Chairman about talked about soft information. And that is, in, that is something which you personally, when you, when you interact with people, you feel it. Uh, there is a touch and feel uh, aspect of the soft information that's generated, which probably is not captured. So my, my quick take on all, all the practitioners here is, how do you see cash flow and how do you, from your vast experience, feel cash flows can be captured? And all of those who are there, out there in the fintech area, uh, I think uh, when you score, when you develop models, when you develop products, processes, uh, I think there is, there, is a, it, there is a very great need for cash flow capturing. Uh, surrogates, possible, whatever, whichever way it is. Yeah. So my quick point from uh, my left on to the right is that how do you see importance of cash flow and how do you think that you can capture it into a system to enable all other products to flow and if we do that we could probably flow more than credit there is there's a bouquet of services which are waiting for you thank you so Ganesh and one minute please. thank you <coughs> so uh, cash flow uh, trapping or first as catching the cash flows and then trapping it we do it at an entity level. For example, at the FPO level, if uh, there is a uh, sales that the FPO does of commodities having done a procurement loan through us, is done through an escrow account. So cash flow uh, assessment and trapping is a foundation of a working capital limits. But to answer your question, sir, at, at a farmer level, uh, how do you do that? At this point in time, I, I may not have a very intelligent answer to that question, but uh, one thing that uh, uh, this forum needs to look at is that there has to be investment, there has to be finance or there needs, there is a need for financing of farmers for creating assets so that they can participate in the value chain. Our own experiences at many places, uh, there, is a, there is a gap between the need, the value chain activities that the FPO does and the assets that the farmers have. And that gap leads to an inefficient performance and not, not a higher equilibrium. So, that is something that we should actively think. I think farmer financing in a, uh, through a technology-enabled process uh, with, a, with an underwriting mechanism which is very unique is, is the need of the art. Yeah. Uh, so when it comes to uh, cash flow assessment, actually there are a lot of efforts by the market players to build templates for different, different activities. If it is in a, uh, a Kirana shop, you know, one kind of template will be used or if it is a uh, saloon shop or something service oriented shop you know different templates will be used but there are a lot of efforts but uh, you know i would say you know this is too complex to understand because the everyday basis you know the cash flow changes uh, but um, at, uh, for microfinance you know now you know we are going by income assessment based uh, uh, credit assessment okay so now lot more uh, innovations will happen but especially for our small business loan portfolio, uh, our major strength is on the uh, credit assessment uh, or cash flow, capturing the cash flow. Because, you know, we don't, since I was, I mentioned that, you know, we serve informal segment, we don't have uh, the evidences or proofs or documentation for the income. So it is uh, done manually, you know, there is a custom, custom uh, templates created for different activities. But however, there is a lot of human intervention is required. It is not automated, not error free, but you know, it is based on the individual person or the credit officer who sits with the customer and understands. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, as far as the cash flow is concerned, these are at best estimates currently. But uh, in our case, uh, one reliable thing of cash flow that is a diary. Supposing if uh, you are giving loans where the diary activity is there, the inflow of cash would have been through digital means and uh, the dairy societies would have paid them to the bank account that is one so therefore what i would uh, wish uh, like you know all payments to our customers if it is in the digital form it is uh, good i know of one um, organization in bengaluru which extensively uh, promotes or encourages people to go for cash flow management they give a qr code and all the vendors, etc., are supposed to collect their uh, uh, revenues through digital means, and that becomes basis for their credit assessment. So the best practice, again, uh, like most banks, like right now they are giving passbooks. Instead, they should give QR codes for both loans as well as uh, savings account, and encourage them. Uh, you from any platform uh, get receipts into your bank account. 
so that way uh, it will improve the cash flow assessment no other tool etc unless it is pass through bank account is a, a, a very correct assessment of a cash flow this is what i suggest thank you so much to say i mean to say that cash flow is a complicated business is an understatement actually uh, cash flow is impossible to assess because people are afraid of talking about their cash flows because there are so many subsidies available in the from the government if somebody says he is above poverty line he will not uh, he will be deprived of so many subsidies so you never say, talk about cash flows but of course we can informally uh, make some assessments because poor people have multiple sources of income and uh, most of it is in cash in fact after demonetization the cash in the market has actually doubled so from 15 lakh crore to 30 lakh crore and we are talking of cash flows i don't think it's a, it's a, i don't think we must discuss about cash flows <coughs> i have a slightly different view i think cash flow is everything <coughs> any true assessment of need will have to come from some assessment of cash flow uh yes it is a problem each institution will have to have its own templates will have to have a lot of skill development in disparate number of institutions which is not easy but one exciting development is happening which is the india stack driven ocen or open credit enablement network where a lot of apis are being developed for capturing for interfacing with various institutions and for to be able to capture a lot of information whether it is from the gst based information whether it is from the dairy sector <coughs> from the cash flows from of the dairy sector total procurement total sales etc as this develops i think maybe in just a matter of 3 years we may have a network where digitally we may be able to get significant amount of cash flow information or data which would help enable us to relatively easily make cash flow based assessments i think that is the way to go yeah uh, so cash flow if you see offlet uh, banks are also adopting cash flow method and in one for sidb we are also launching some product based on cash flows so basically cash flow based lending we have to leverage on technology no other way based on the technology and using our artificial intelligence and machine learning kind of thing we have to take data because if you see earlier the turnaround time of for giving a loan even at sidbi i will say up to 5 crore loan we used to take lot of time like at least 2 weeks 3 weeks now we are giving and we are sanctioning and disbursing a loan up to 5 crore within a week time week time we are able to disburse that because every data is getting analyzed and we are getting we are getting an output so that is the reason same way the cash flow also with the technology definitely we will be able to assess the cash flows very well and that will be a major parameter a crucial parameter for making credit decision thank you thank you so much so we are uh, Sir, yeah come on can i have one yeah. one small point i mean because two points which were not covered from what you said one was the stress biometer uh, um, barometer that you talked about uh, no it was not addressed i think it is very very important to understand that stress level uh, impact on microfinance sector is the most compared to any other sector so it is truly a stress biometer in that case how do we handle this the consequences of this i think one of the areas where development has not taken place and must take place is the insurance sector to cover these stresses for example if there is a cyclone or a tsunami is there an insurance to be able to cover such microfinance clients so that say three inst next three installments are covered by the insurance so by that time they will get back on their feet and be able to put their lives together their activities together and be able to pay can that be done if there is a pandemic like what happened or an epidemic is there an insurance which covers a few installments maybe just to give them that much breathing time to get back on their feet i think that is necessary to be linked with the understanding that the microfinance sector is a stress biometer i think that's what i wanted to share thank you so much uh, for that uh, so we conclude here with just a couple of uh, uh, you know i would like to just make uh, that uh, some of the key takeaways probably one is uh, you know preempting or stealing from the last uh, panel is uh, you know an attention to a national capitalization fund uh, which is very important which has gone on to you know demand for a debt i think uh, the stock uh, social stock market is also coming up probably more attention is required there uh, 
you know one of the most important takeaway is uh, you know even mr manjunath i don't hear i did personally didn't hear him say that he don't like cash flows what he said is that there are entrenched legacy issues which actually is another great challenge uh, for for when you get into cash flow so basically what we need is we need to build up surrogates we need to 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 convert soft information into into understandable knowledge and uh, those are all areas i think that's one takeaway which sadhan uh, should uh, consider that cash flow the challenge of understanding cash flows and then indexing it so that uh, the you know the classification and segmentation of uh, of uh, livelihood based financing can go up in as a percentage of the total segment uh, finance and uh, the last point of course is that here i would say that there is a huge space for big data analysis to come in and probably when you when i speak of good data uh, you know big data i'm also talking about fundamentally the nature you know the the, the significance of big data is dynamic data uh, and within that i think when all of you from the sector probably when you collect data you need to curate data collection in such a way that soft data the 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 i assessments the feel assessments all of that need to be converted into information captured and then got into indexing thank you so much Thank you so much. The session two was definitely insightful. Please give them a big round of applause. And now, request our CEO, Mr. G. G. Mamman, to please join us on the stage and felicitate the speakers. Questions? Do you have any questions to ask the speakers? <laughs> Ex chairman of Sadhan, to please join us on the stage and felicitate the speakers. Please give them a big round of applause. I now request him to felicitate our moderator, Mr. C. P. Morgan, sector expert. Give it to him. I now request him to felicitate our speaker, Mr. Vivekanand Salimat, Chairman, IDF Financial Services, Private Limited. I now request him to felicitate Dr. L. H. Manjunath. E D S K D R D P. I now request him to felicitate Mr. A. Ramesh Kumar, Chairman and MD, La Raksha Impact Finance Enterprise, Private Limited. I now request him to felicitate our speaker, Mr. Anbaraj, D G M Sidbi. I now request him to felicitate our speaker, Mr. Chella Durai, National Head, Microfinance, Equitas Small Finance Bank. I request him to felicitate our speaker, Mr. N. Ganesh, Senior Vice President, Samunati. I request the guest on the stage to please come forward for a group picture. Thank you so much. Give them a, once again a big round of applause. I request everyone to take off the dais.